Good afternoon. My name is Christopher Adams, and as the rector of St. Paul's College, I welcome everyone to our second of three lectures for the 2021 Hanley Lecture Series. Before we begin, I want to state that St. Paul's College, the University of Manitoba, and our city of Winnipeg sit at the crossroads of the Anishinaabe, Métis, Cree, Dakota, and OG Cree nations. We acknowledge specifically that we are in Treaty 1 territory and on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe peoples and the homeland of the Métis Nation. We are committed to the pathways of reconciliation, and we hope all those participating in today's lecture are able to join St. Paul's College in these endeavors. I join with my colleagues at St. Paul's College in once again welcoming Dr. Kathleen Sprouse Cummings as our 2021 Hanley Lecturer. Before I introduce you to Dr. Cummings again for the second lecture, for those who are not present for the first lecture, which is posted on YouTube, I want to say a few words about the Hanley Lecture series and its creation. John Hanley, known as by many as Jack, was born in Winnipeg in 1910. He attended St. Paul's for one year of high school and then St. Jerome's College in Waterloo, followed by the Grand Seminary in Montreal. At the age of 23, he joined the Jesuits and studied philosophy at the Jesuit Seminary in Toronto. He was ordained a priest in 1945. After completing his studies, in 1949, he returned to Winnipeg where he taught both high school and university co courses at the college. From 1959 until the end of the 1960s, he restricted his teaching to university courses at St. Paul's College. At the early age of 60, he died of a brain tumor and his funeral mass was conducted in our St. Paul's College Christ the King Chapel. To honor the memory of Father John C. Hanley, SJ, his friends and colleagues at St. Paul's College and the Department of Religion at the University of Manitoba established the Hanley Memorial Lecture Series in 1980. This prestigious Hanley Lecture Series annually brings to Winnipeg someone who is either a prominent theologian, scripture scholar, or a leading authority on current religious issues. As you can see, due to pandemic related challenges, things are different this year. This year, we are spacing the lectures by having them given in the form of one per month, that is in February, March, and April. I think this is giving us a chance to ponder the lectures as we go over the three month period. Please be advised that this event will be recorded. At the end of the lecture, you will be able to pose questions. Simply indicate your question in the Q&A Zoom feature or for those on Facebook attending the lecture, please type your question and our technicians will advise us of the question. Now about this year's Hanley Lecturer, as I introduced her last time, I'll do it again. Kathleen Sprose Cummings is Professor of American Studies and History at the University of Notre Dame, where she also directs the Kashwa Center for the Study of American Catholicism. Dr. Cummings holds a concurrent appointment in Gender Studies and the Department of Theology, sorry, appointment in Gender Studies and, and also with the Department of Theology at Notre Dame, and is also an affiliated faculty member in Italian Studies and the Nanovic Institute for European Studies. Dr. Sprouse Cummings' most recent book, A Saint of Our Own, and I have it here, A Saint of Our Own, How the Quest for a Holy Hero Helped Catholics Become American, was published by the University of North Carolina Press in 2019. This is one of her many publications, including her first book, New, Welcome, New Women of the Old Faith, Gender and American Catholicism in the Progressive Era. And this is the other one I have here. This was published in 2009. Dr. Sprouse Cummings is often asked to comment in the media on issues pertaining to Catholicism and other areas of her expertise. This includes NBC, the New York Times, and just last month, the Winnipeg Free Press. I now welcome Dr. Kathleen Sprouse Cummings to give the second of three Henley lectures. Dr. Cummings? Good afternoon. Thank you, Dr. Adams, for that introduction. I'm absolutely delighted to be back here with you all again. This afternoon's lecture doesn't presume that you viewed last month's, uh, but it does, however, revisit some of the figures that surfaced in that lecture, albeit with a different angle. I'm going to share my screen now, and uh, we'll turn to the first of our people we will meet this afternoon. 
sorry, having a little trouble. There we go. So this, uh, this subject of today's lecture is gender, power, and canonization. And for those who attended last time, you'll recall that I spoke of being at the canonization of Brother Andre Bassett in October 2011. And on that same day in St. Peter's Square, St. Mary MacKillop was canonized as the very first saint, very first canonized saint from Australia. And I used MacKillop's story to the theme of nationalism and sanctity. I'm going to begin with MacKillop today, but to introduce the topic of gender. And I'm absolutely delighted to be able to do so in the month that we celebrate as Women's History Month, both in Canada and the United States. MacKillop, I learned after I attended her canonization, had uh, run into quite a few problems during her lifetime after she publicly exposed a local clergy member who had been molesting young children. The priest was punished, but his cronies sought revenge against MacKillop and spread a great deal of slander about her that eventually resulted in her excommunication. The bishop who excommunicated her uh, revoked that on his deathbed, but for the rest of her life, Mary MacKillop suffered at the hands of ecclesial leaders who distrusted her and again, many of whom sought revenge for what she had done. Obviously, MacKillop's story takes on new residence in the light of new, revolution, uh, new revelations in the ongoing clergy sex abuse crisis. But as a historian of Catholic sisters in particular, these stories are legion uh, and very close um, to home in the case of a woman named Mother Theodore Guerin, a French missionary who arrived in my, uh, in my state of Indiana, where I teach at Notre Dame, um, in 1840. Uh, she led a band of six sisters to Southern Indiana, to Vincennes, Indiana. And uh, just a year after she arrived, Father Edward Soren, the Holy Cross priest who eventually founded the University of Notre Dame, where I teach, arrived in Vincennes. The two French missionaries were friends and collaborators. Garin even gave Soren uh, two oxen and a cart when he began his journey in the northern reaches of the Diocese of Vincennes. And I have a map here. So here you can see Vincennes. The city is down there. And Soren came up north, uh, close to the Michigan border, where Notre Dame has been since 1842. Part of the common cause that Mother Theodore and Father Soren made was the fact that they shared a common nemesis in the Bishop of Vincennes. Soren's mission to the North had in, in part been motivated by uh, his desire to distance himself from the Bishop. Many of the difficulties involved blurred lines of authority in a frontier church and the lapses in communication that inevitably occur, uh, occurred at that point in the 19th century. But there was no question that gender added another layer to the problem as the experience of Mother Theodore makes clear. The Bishop of Vincennes insisted, contrary to can canon law, that he had control over Guerin's community finances, its property, and the assignment of the sisters. The conflict reached a crisis in 1847 when the Bishop actually locked Guerin in his house for a period of about 24 hours until she agreed to accede to his demands. A day later, he removed her as superior, released her from her religious vows and threatened her and any sister who uh, stayed in Indiana with excommunication. Garen resolved to start over again in the Diocese of Detroit, but in what was, uh, in retrospect, providential timing, word arrived from Rome that the bishop had been replaced as the, uh, uh, as the Bishop of Vincennes. Actually, he, uh, to his credit, he had been trying to retire for a long time. He knew he was not well suited to the position of bishop and his uh, uh, resignation was finally accepted. He left, Garen stayed and the Sisters of Providence have, Providence have flourished in Indiana and beyond uh, ever since. So Mary McKillop and Mother Theodore are just two examples of women for whom canonization provided a means for her real rehabilitation. Both were regarded as unruly women or disobedient to their vows in their lifetimes. And yet through canonization, they are held up for universal veneration. This is an absolutely fascinating lens on gender and canonization. And we can see it with a number of other female saints, but I'm taking this analysis in another direction. And I'd like to use canonization to explore how women have been systematically excluded from power structures within the Catholic Church, and in turn, 
how canonization has become an arena for women both to claim power within the church and to define their relationship within it. I'm going to do this by speaking of two women, both of whom are now among the 12 people in, who lived in what is now the United States who are canonized saint, saints. One of them, ha, one, the cause of one of them was almost derailed entirely by a gender-based conflict. And the second was canonized, if not exactly against the will of her spiritual daughters, then at least against their instinct. I referenced both of them in my first lecture, and you may recall that Philippine Duchenne uh, here was a French missionary who ministered in what is now the what was the Diocese of St. Louis and died in Missouri in 1852. Uh, she emerged one of the first candidates to be proposed for canonization from either the United States or Canada. She was called the Rose of Missouri and really paired very nicely with the Lily of the Mohawks, Tekakwita in terms of an early ex exemplar of holiness in the United States and Canada in Tekawitha's case. I mentioned uh, in the first lecture, but it's important to, to emphasize for this one, that custom demanded that when women's congregations were proposing one of their own for canonization, they needed to work, they needed to find a male clergy member to represent them. The RSCJs, Duchenne's congregation, uh, asked the Jesuits first, as I also said, the Jesuits were very good at promoting causes for canonization. Uh, but of course, the Jesuits had their own saintly fish to fry in the North American martyrs. So they turned the RSCJs down. The Franciscans also refused them. And the Archbishop of St. Louis assigned a diocesan priest but he refused to communicate with the sisters regularly. So the cause made no progress. Between 1898 and 1901, a very enterprising young uh, religious of the Sacred Heart named Ellen McGloin appeared to have acted as Duchenne's postulator, the person representing the cause in Rome. She was never appointed as such, but she lived in Rome for two years and gathered and copied all of Duchenne's writing. In 2001, uh, sorry, in 1901, she was ordered back to the United States and prohibited from acting in that capacity, but she did try. The prohibition against women acting as postulators representing in Rome or even as vice postulators promoting the cause on the local level um, was made explicit in the 1917 Code of Canon Law. This uh, canon 2004 uh, spelled out that women in proposing causes of canonization had to work through male proxies and moreover, not male proxies of their own choosing, but those that were appointed by the sacred congregation, the Vatican dicastery in charge of overseeing causes for canonization. McGloin's unsuccessful effort to assume responsibility for shepherding Duchenne's cause foreshadowed other attempts that Catholic sisters would make to wrest control over the, the causes for can their causes for canonization from male clergy members. By far the most spectacular story of this relates to another woman who surfaced in my talk last month, Elizabeth Ann Seton. And uh, I have her basic information up here, born in New York City in 1774, who was a widowed mother of five when she converted to Catholicism in 1805. Alienated after her conversion from Protestant friends and family in New York, Seton briefly considered moving to Quebec before she relocated to Baltimore, where she founded the Sisters of Charity. Though she modeled her new community, closely on the French daughters of the French Daughters of Charity of St. Vincent de Paul, Seton chose for a variety of reasons not to formally ally with them. And that's gonna become very important. Today, Elizabeth Ann Seton is arguably the best known of the US Catholic saints. Catholic schools and parishes throughout the country are named after her. Far more institutions are named for her, in fact, than to any of the other 11 US canonized saints. Seton's status as a canonized, uh, as an iconic American was affirmed in a very public way in 2015 when Pope Francis visited the White House and received as the official state gift, a key to Seton's home in Emmitsburg, Maryland, where she had moved the Sisters of Charity shortly after their founding. <clears throat> 
Despite Seton's prominence on the contemporary American landscape though, her cause for canonization very nearly uh, did not succeed and was almost derailed entirely in what is truly a wild story about the intersection of piety, power, and politics, particularly politics related to gender. It's a story that wild as it is, is largely untold. Pictured is Sister Isabel Tui, uh, the superior of the Daughters of Charity, who is all but unknown outside her, of her congregation. She would be remembered in her congregation, of course, but uh, there is not much known about her outside of that. She destroyed most of her papers, uh, particularly those relating to the conflict I'm about to describe. Um, but I can say unequivocally that were it not for Sister Isabel Tui, Seton would never become, never have become a canonized saint. Through Tui's efforts to act on her own and on her community's behalf to sponsor Seton's cause, in other words, in trying to become the arbiter of Seton's afterlife. Tui was also attempting to become the author of her own life in a church that literally did not recognize her standing in its official procedures. Like Duchenne, Seton had emerged as one of the first candidates for sainthood uh, in, from North America. In fact, she was the lone one unconnected to the European missionary enterprise in those early years. You'll recall I discussed the Jesuit martyrs, Tekakwita and Philippine Duchenne, all of whom were connected uh, in some way or another to European missionaries, but Seton was native born. Seton lagged behind all of them for reasons that had absolutely nothing to do with events in her lifetime but were rooted in a conflict that had begun a quarter century after her death in New York City, where she had sent the first, uh, the conflict began in New York City, where she had sent the first Sisters of Charity from Emmitsburg in 1817. By the mid 1840s, the city's Archbishop John Hughes was growing increasingly irritated by the sisters refusal to teach boys over seven as prescribed by their rule. At almost the exact same moment, Mother Theodore Guerin was battling with the Bishop of Vincennes, Archbishop Hughes in New York forced each sister of charity in his diocese to make a choice. To stay in New York in a breakaway community and become diocesan, subject to his authority, or to return to the Emmitsburg mother house. And of course, return doesn't even really make sense because none of them had ever necessarily been to Emmitsburg. They were all from New York. About half stayed and became the Sisters of Charity of New York, subject to the authority of Hughes and his successors, and half went back to, um, went to Emmitsburg. Meanwhile, the Emmitsburg-based Sisters of Charity had begun at the behest of their clerical advisors to seek unification with the Daughters of Charity of St. Vincent de Paul, the French community that Seton had once looked to as her guide. In 1850, the Emmitsburg community became the US province of this international congregation. From that point on, the sisters at Emmitsburg would be called the Daughters of Charity and wear the habit of the French congregation. Because of their new rather elaborate headgear, they were called cornets. Members of the community that had chosen to stay in New York retained the name Sisters of Charity and the original dress of the community, which included a small black cap commonly worn by widows during Seton's lifetime. Soon, Seton's spiritual tree became more intricate. And I don't wanna spend a lot of time on this, but just to give the idea that it's, it's complicated. Diocesan communities sprouted at Cincinnati, Greensburg, Pennsylvania, Newark, New Jersey, and Halifax, Nova Scotia. By 1870, a total of six separate congregations considered Seton their founder. These communities were distinct, not only in name and in dress, but also in their memories of Elizabeth Ann Seton. The Emmitsburg sister, the Emmitsburg based Daughters of Charity understood Seton to have been a loyal daughter of St. Vincent, who would have viewed that formal affiliation with the French daughters as the fulfillment of her most ardent desire. The diocesan communities, on the other hand, believed that Seton had been fiercely committed to the independence of the communities and thus would have opposed the union with France. They believed themselves to be Seton's authentic spiritual daughters in this regard, and some of them published history saying so. Now, throughout the 19th century, there was no need to reconcile these competing narratives. 
And had Seton never been proposed for canonization, they might have continued to exist in perpetuity. But canonization requires a single story, and Seton's supporters would eventually have to agree on one if her cause were to succeed. But not yet. At this initial stage, it was only necessary to determine where the cause would be introduced. And actually, that because she had died in Emmitsburg, it was pretty clear that it would be introduced from there. The question was, would the other communities join in co-sponsorship of the cause? They had an obvious stake in it. And perhaps more importantly, their very existence lent the cause a tremendous advantage. Founders of religious communities are often granted an exemption from one of the required miracles, something that could accelerate a cause. You'll recall that the North American martyrs in part were canonized so quickly because they were exempted from a miracle having died as martyrs. Seton was clearly not a founder of the Daughters of Charity, which had originated in France, but she was certainly the founder of the diocesan communities that grew from her initial establishment. Nevertheless, infrequent contact and geographical distance would have made coordination very difficult. And ultimately, the decision was not left to the sisters themselves, but to their brothers in the Vincentian family, the members of the Congregation of the Mission, or Vincentians as they were commonly known. And in 1897, Vincentian superiors decreed that the Daughters of Charity at Emmitsburg should be the sole sponsors. Seton's cause finally opened in 1907, and it took another 18 years for the material to be sent to Rome. The delay is owed both to American inexperience in saint making and Vincentian apathy. The congregation was also sponsoring the causes for canonization for Daughters of Charity, Louise de Marillac and Catherine Labouret. And it made sense that most of its saint seeking energy would be channeled to these two French women with impeccable Vincentian bona fides, rather than that of an American daughter who had essentially entered the congregation posthumously in the sense that the formal alliance between the US sisters and their French counterparts had occurred 30 years after Seton's death. In 1934, Charles Souvet became superior of the Vincentians though, and he took an avid interest in Seton's cause. This slide appeared in my first lecture in the context of Tekikwitha's cause being slowed down. And this is the words of Souvet trying to push Seton as the true American cause, uh, as opposed to Tekikwitha. Here he's accusing uh, Tekikwitha of not being an American. And I also uh, made the point that in the 1930s, the time was ripe for other reasons. I mentioned Leonard Feeney suggesting that Elizabeth Ann Seton could be Elizabeth of New York, an achievement of holiness of the new world, the first uh, American saint. It helped that Seton's distant cousin, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was in the White House at the time. And FDR always brought up Seton's name whenever he spoke to Catholic audiences. It's likely that he did so in 1936 when he received uh, at his home in Hyde Park, um, the highest ranking Vatican official ever to visit the United States, uh, Cardinal Secretary of State Eugenio Pacelli, widely predicted to become the next Pope. What is certain is that the apostolic delegate pictured here did broach with Pacelli, the subject of Seton's canonization, and urged him to do what he could to move her cause forward at the Holy See. It had not yet been introduced. That nudge would pay off less than three years later when Pacelli was indeed elevated to the papacy. Not only did the Pope's passing familiarity with Seton's story raise the hopes of her supporters, but the conclave that elected him placed a few of them in a position to engineer a breakthrough in her cause. Nothing had been heard about it since its final documentation had been sent 14 years before. A record three U.S. cardinals participated in the conclave that elected Pacelli, the largest contingent ever from the United States. One of them was Philadelphia's Cardinal Dennis Dougherty, pictured here. Dougherty had become an avid Seton supporter through his friendship with Salvatore Burgio, a Vincentian priest who often accompanied him on his travels. Um, here they are pictured in Manila in 1937. And in early winter 1939, Burgio joined Dougherty's uh, entourage for the trip to the conclave. While there, they met with the prefect at the Sacred Congregation of Rites and asked that Seton's cause be accelerated. 
They opened with a classic canonization strategy in which supporters of a candidate suggest that he or she will fulfill a certain unmet spiritual need. We saw that with the quest for an American patron saint, patron saints for the US and Canada. They referenced the canonization three months previously, I'm sorry, the beatification three months previously of Francis Cabrini, an Italian born missionary who would become the first US citizen so honored in November, 1938. Bergio and Doherty explained that Cabrini's beatification left US Catholics longing more desperately for a saint who had been born and raised in America. The prefect sympathized, but warned that Seton's cause was likely to remain tabled at the Holy See until the obvious discrepancy was resolved. The discrepancy I mentioned earlier, the Emmitsburg and uh, uh, congregational, the, the, the tangled, Seton's tangled uh, progeny, spiritual progeny. The day of reckoning had arrived. No matter how much sense the decision to list the daughters as the sole petitioners had made in those early days, it resulted in an inconsistency that would not meet Rome's exacting standards uh, once the cause was introduced there. The documentation that had been sent for Seton's cause made clear that members of all of these communities looked to Seton as their spiritual mother and believed her to be their founder and thus eligible for the miracle exemption often awarded on these grounds. What the prefect of the sacred congregation made clear was that Seton's promoters could not have it both ways. If they were going to make the case that Seton was truly a founder of all these communities, the daughters could not remain the sole sponsors, but they needed to share that role, not only with the New York branch that had originally separated from Emmitsburg in 1846, but also with all the other independent communities that had whose founding postdated that original breach. Meeting the mediating the transition from a project shepherded almost exclusively by the daughters to one sponsored by all of these communities required sensitivity and tact, neither of which were the strong suits of the man who emerged from that conclave era conversation as the vice postulator or local overseer of Seton's cause, Doherty's friend, Salvatore Bergio. There was no question that Bergio was committed to seeing the, the cause succeed. But before long, his tactics raised questions about whether he was more committed to Seton's glorification or his own. Returning to the United States, Bergio moved to Emmitsburg, Maryland, where he set up an office at the Daughters of Charity Mother House. He commandeered the services of two sisters as his assistants, each of whom, he insisted, was subject to his immediate control, even intimating that their obedience to him superseded the vow of obedience that they had taken in religious life. The sisters tried to evict Bergio, but he appealed time and again to Doherty, who in turn used his power at the Holy See to issue a proclamation affirming Bergio's authority over the sisters. Bergio also ruffled feathers on the road as he visited each of these diocesan communities ostensibly to invite them to become Seton's petitioners. For a mission of reconciliation, his efforts in this regard engendered an uncommon amount of dissension. He would misrepresent the Vincentian Superior's original motivation for not including the, the Sisters of Charity as sponsors. Again, that had been one of simple expediency, but he informed each superior that the sisters had been de deliberately excluded because the daughters wanted to maintain exclusive control. He also demanded that each of the six communities pay what he called a yearly tax to support the cause, a requirement that flouted canon law, but nonetheless padded his own budget and uh, financed many of his travels. The conflict uh, escalated a great deal when Sister Isabel Tui entered the scene after she became superior of the Daughters of Charity. Even less inclined than her predecessors to cede authority to the haughty Vincentian, Tui became Virgil's primary adv adversary in what he characterized as his war with Emmitsburg. Bergio maligned Tui to superiors in, the, superiors in the US and in France, insisting that she wished to retain for the daughters the exclusive right for sponsorship over Seton's cause. That accusation was entirely untrue. Tui was well aware that what the sacred congregation had said and she accepted the need for shared sponsorship. On the other hand, Bergio also accused her of not respecting his authority. And that was undoubtedly true. Tui's real objection was the need to work through Bergio, 
In one of the few extant letters related to this conflict from Tui's side of the, of, the, of the story, she wrote a letter to the Vincentian Superior General in France about Burgio's tactics and overreach and speaking for her community argued that we are as a province, a more responsible and permanent organization than the Mother Seton Guild founded by Father Burgio. Essentially, Sister Isabel was asking that the daughters be permitted to replace Burgio as petitioners. This was prohibited by canon law and she was told so. Meanwhile, Burgio continued to create problems. He spent a great deal of time in Rome after World War II and uh, in uh, multiple audiences with Pope Pius the 12th, he lobbied assiduously on Seton's behalf, especially after the canonization of Francis Cabrini, who again, he argued wasn't a true American saint because she hadn't been born and bred in America. At one point, Burgio even told the pontiff that canonizing Seton would be an appropriate way for him to express his gratitude to the American people for all the support they had given to Italy and Europe during and after World War II. If the imperialist assumptions behind Burgio's demand to the Pope reflected the American post-war mood, the conversation also highlighted the, also highlighted the imperiousness that alienated Tui and many others. Having failed in her attempt to replace Burgio as vice postulator, she tried to run an end game around him. She traveled to each diocesan community, begged forgiveness for past sins, and invited all the superiors to join her in a loose confederation called Mother Seton's Daughters that would be united for the purpose of promoting Seton's cause. The strategy was brilliant. Burgio could not continue to accuse her of wanting to retain the daughter's exclusive control if she herself was making overtures of this kind. And in October, 1947, the first conference of Mother Seton's Daughters met at Emmitsburg. It's absolutely wonderful to read the minutes because these women came together not only to profess their love for their spiritual mother and the desire that she be canonized, but also their effort to come to terms with their tangled history. The sisters of the superior of the sisters in New York, for example, the site of the original split a century before, spoke of the enduring connection each daughter and sister of charity had to Mother Seton and pointed out that the cause of the rupture had not been the fault of the sisters, but the fault of Archbishop John Hughes. They talked about how the myth of an estrangement among the sisters and daughters had only been perpetuated by outsiders and that they were perfectly willing to work in harmony whenever the need for concerted action arose. It was time again for the sisters to work in concerted action, and they resolved to do so in becoming their own standard bearers in advancing Seton's cause for canonization. The sisters had pointedly not invited Burgio to join their gathering, and predictably, he was outraged. When the group barred him from a separate meeting, uh, he demanded that they include him and uh, began to uh, malign Sister Isabel uh, to anyone he could, referring to her as a battle ax who resembled Uncle Joe Stalin. Stalin. The Kremlin, he wrote to Doherty, has nothing on Emmitsburg. As the situation moved toward a crisis, New York's Cardinal Spellman became alarmed. Cardinal Spellman was a powerful archbishop who longed to bask in Seton's reflective glory. He seized on that term that Leonard Feeney had, had used, Elizabeth of New York, and he looked forward to the day when she could be canonized. He asked a canon lawyer uh, named Damien Blair to research the history of Seton's cause and the nature of the conflict, and Blair produced a lengthy report that concluded this conflict between the daughters and Burgio was extraneous to the cause itself. It actually had nothing to do with the cause. It is a real red herring, he wrote, which is distracting everyone and focusing attention on the wrong place. Unless it was resolved, the cause would not succeed, both because of the time and attention it was taking away from the real work, and also because the Holy See would not be likely to move forward with a beatification tainted by scandalous overtones. As an aside, the beatification of Bishop Fulton Sheen, which had been scheduled for December 2019 in Peoria, Illinois, was postponed. Uh, just It was announced just a week before it was scheduled that it was postponed, again, 
because of scandalous overtones, the suggestion that while Sheen was Bishop of Rochester, New York, um, there had been a cover up in terms of abusers. And so with all the causes for canonization uh, at the Holy See, uh, there is no motivation, strong disincentive to move forward with one that has complications of this sort. And this is what happened here. Now, Cardinal Spellman is known for his diplomatic skills, which he deployed in Washington and Rome throughout his long tenure as New York's Archbishop. But perhaps his greatest success was when he convened the Daughters of Charity, all of the, sister, the superiors of the Sisters of Charity, um, Salvatore Bergio, the Archbishop of Baltimore, uh, another canon lawyer, and two Italian priests from the Sacred Congregation in Rome in September of 1848 at the College of Mount St. Vincent, which was run by the Sisters of Charity of New York. He brokered a fragile peace and uh, got Bergio and the Sisters and Daughters of Charity to agree to work together. Unfortunately, it turned out to be a very fragile one. By 1950, Tui's distrust of Bergio had risen to such a level that she decided to travel to Rome herself to request a new vice postulator. This news alarmed Bergio, who warned that she would create headaches once she gets in direct communication with the Sacred Congregation of Rites. Bergio had good reason to worry. And again, he was insisting that her access to officials at the Holy See be mediated through him, but also uh, through other uh, male clergy members. But once Tui took it upon herself to visit Rome and to um, really tell her side of the story, uh, she met with some success as the Holy See did request that Bergio resign as Seton's vice postulator. Even though he had long maintained that he'd be happy to resign if Rome requested it, at the moment of truth, he himself flew to Rome and with the help of Cardinal Doherty, uh, retained his position. He returned to the United States with a signed document that absolved him of guilt and stated his rights as vice postulator. This declaration did seem to give him the unassailable authority he craved. And so matters continued with meanwhile, Seton's cause not moving forward. I wanna skip ahead to this uh, nine years in the story to this remarkable picture, which was the declaration, uh, which was taken on the day that Seton was declared venerable, an important step in the process in Rome. You can see Sister Isabel holding the declaration, Spellman is there as well, along with representatives, superiors of all the, all the diocesan communities, and you can see them in their different uh, differentiated habits. Who was not in the picture? Salvatore Bergio. He had died three months before. None of his obituaries hinted at the rancor his reign as Seton's vice postulator had engendered. Instead, they emphasized the way that he had worked tirelessly on her behalf and appeared to be continuing to do so in his own afterlife. It was no accident, the editor of the Mother Seton Guild Bulletin opined, that just weeks after Father Bergio's death, Mother Seton's cause leaped forward the implication was that Bergio, now in God's presence himself, had used his heavenly influence to propel Seton to venerable status. Of course, that was simply not true. The fact was that Bergio was conveniently out of the way and things could move forward. The fracturing of Seton's community in the middle of the 19th century and the structures of power that allowed Bergio to hold up her canonization in the middle of the 20th, all the while enjoying the protection of Doherty and other church uh, officials, call attention to the interlocking systems of gender and power in the church, certainly hierarchy over clergy and clergy over lay, but what this also means de facto is the power of men over women. Of course, this happened at precisely the moment that so much in the Catholic world was on the verge of transformation. And indeed the significance of Tui's extended conflict with and eventual triumph over Bergio extends beyond the particular cause of Elizabeth Ann Seton's canonization. This alliance that she arranged between Mother Seton's daughters, which tightened throughout the 50s and 60s, signified a transitional moment in the history of US Catholic sisters. On the one hand, too, we had adopted a strategy long relied uh, upon by sisters to circumvent what they saw as unjust impositions of clerical authority. Mothers Theodore Guerin and Mary McKillop had also cultivated sympathetic clerical and Episcopal allies to help mediate their conflicts. 
But on the other hand, Tui's determination to plead her case personally in Rome and her attempt to create a competing source of authority in solidarity with women outside of her particular religious community signaled a very new chapter in that history. It was replicated on a larger scale with the founding of an umbrella organization of Catholic Sisters, the Conference of Major Superiors of Women in the United States. Apart from its other effects, developing an identity as sisters with small s would soon lead many Catholic sisters to become more vocal in defying bullies like Burgio and increasingly insistent on representing themselves at the Holy See. This became readily apparent in the midst of the Second Vatican Council. No women were present at the first two sessions, but uh, for the third and fourth, 15 women were appointed though they were given neither a voice nor a vote. Mary Lou Tobin, president of the US umbrella organization of major superiors of women, was one of 15 women at the council's third and fourth sessions. She remembered that Vatican II offered an opening, although just a tiny crack in the door, a recognition of the vast indifference toward women and the ignoring of their potential within the whole body of the church. Perfecta Caritatis, or the decree on adaptation of religious life, urged congregations to reflect on how their founder's vision would translate into the modern world. For some Catholic women's religious communities in the United States, the call to re-examine their founding charism in the light of the contemporary world reinvigorated a number of causes for canonization that had lost momentum. For many though, the decrees of the council actually had the opposite effect, especially in light of other council documents like Gaudium et Spes, the pastoral constitution on the church in the modern world. Its message prompted many US sisters to choose new forms of ministry and inspire them to a greater commitment to racial justice. What did this mean for Philippine Duchenne? Well, I had mentioned in the last lecture, she had beatified at last in 1940 a very promising miracle materialized in 1951 and another one later in that decade, and it was sent to Rome for scrutiny there. Giddily optimistic that her canonization was imminent, the RSCJ superiors had even petitioned the Holy See to delay their planned 1964 general congregation so that it might, be, it might coincide with Duchenne's canonization. They also began to publish a Duchenne build bulletin to publicize the cause. One of the editors of this bulletin was an RSCJ biblical scholar named Catherine Sullivan, who was on the uh, faculty at Manhattanville College in New York. 1964 was an amazing year for Sullivan. At her college's commencement in May, New York's Cardinal Spellman, who was an ad admirer of hers and a good friend, encouraged her to pursue further study in the Holy Land. She was a biblical scholar and had never traveled there. He even offered to cover the cost himself. He submitted an official request to Su Sullivan's immediate superior who then passed it on to the RSCJ's mother general in France. The answer arrived in August, no. Informing Spellman of the decision, the superior explained that Sullivan was needed at the college and giving voice to the rapid pace at which religious life was changing, Brennan continued, I'm sure your eminence will understand that Mother General is being asked for so many dispensations at this time, it is not possible for her to accept them. Spellman was outraged and of course Sullivan was disappointed. Two months later, the RSCJs convened for their general congregation. The Holy See had after all not granted them the delay it had asked for. It was a historic meeting. The Superior General, who at that point had been serving along with Mary Luke Tobin as an auditor at Vatican II for two weeks, noted that, told the delegates that we are at an important hour where religious life by the voice of the church is doubtless going to take a different orientation. The RSCJs adopted a simplified habit and identified experimentation and education, a strong missionary thrust, and an energetic response to the cry for social justice as their new priorities. These changes would transform the religious lives and ministries of the RSCJs. Mother Catherine Sullivan made an especially brisk transition from the old to the new world. The general congregation closed on November 15th. Spellman renewed his offer a week after that, and Sullivan responded jubilantly, jubilantly that the spirit of a made it possible for her to accept it. 
making the upcoming Thanksgiving holiday one of the happiest of her whole life. Sullivan did go to the Holy Land and would return often. She became a renowned scholar and experienced congregational leader. And she's pictured here in 1985 with Pope John Paul II. If the spirit of adjournamento had led to an abrupt pivot in Catherine Sullivan's life, it precipitated an equally sudden reversal in the afterlife of the woman she and other RSCJ regarded as their spiritual mother. For them, the mandates of Vatican II diminished rather than magnified their enthusiasm for their founder's cause. They were no less confident in Philippines holiness. They were simply less inclined to expend the resources required to prove it. In November, 1967, the Duchenne Guild Bulletin announced that it would cease publication given that ca her canonization was quote, not in the foreseeable future. I wanna make clear that the RSCJs did not abandon Duchenne's cause and they never formally renounced their position as petitioners. They did judge, however, that devoting the necessary time, personnel and money toward canonizing Duchenne was no longer justifiable in light of the congregation's renewed commitment to the poor. Such an endeavor, according to one member of the congregation, did not seem in keeping with the spirit of Philippine herself. It seemed Philippine Duchenne was destined to remain a permanent beata. Not so for Elizabeth Ann Seton. You know, miracles, and we can maybe talk more about in the question and answers, but miracles are uh, very difficult to prove. It's a two-step process at the Holy See. First, uh, a, a commission of medical doctors uh, ascertains that the cure is not medically explainable. And then it goes on to a theological commission who determines whether the cure was affected through the intercession of the saint in question. So um, to explain that, uh, Seton supporters, after all they had been through, had a very frustrating moment in the early 1960s when a miracle that was very, very close to approval was thrown out at the last minute because um, uh, it involved the cure of a little girl from cancer. And the mother of the little girl revealed at the very last minute that she had not only invoked the intercession of Elizabeth Ann Seton, but also that of the little flower. And what that meant was that it could not be uh, ascertained for certain that Seton had affected the cure. So um, it didn't count as a miracle. Of course it counted to the little girl and her family, but it did not qualify. But even with all that, Seton's cause moved forward very speedily, and she had two miracles approved uh, in between her Declaration of Venerable in 1959 and March 17, 1963. Spellman engineered uh, another flourish. Um, Seton's cause was reached beatification at the same time as a male U.S. Uh, prospective saint named John Newman, and the Holy See thought it would be a great idea to beatify both of them together. And Spellman said, no, Seton deserved her own day. Um, the congregation, uh, Newman's congregation, the Redemptorists, alleged a feminist conspiracy, but um, it really was about Spellman wanting the day to himself as well as Seton's. And uh, of course it was St. Patrick's Day, which uh, was even more meaningful. Seton continued to hum through the process and was canonized on September 14th, 1975. Her canonization banner is one sign that uh, her cause was, considered an all-American triumph. There she is hovering over North America. Um, but Paul, Pope Paul VI homily also alluded to the significance of Seton's canonization occurring during the United Nations sponsored International Women's Year. Like the UN initiative, the pontiff suggested, Seton's elevation called attention to the role of women in the world and sought to further their authentic advancement in society. The liturgy did incorporate a gender innovation for the first time, a woman read from scripture at the papal mass. Overstating the case, Time Magazine dubbed Seton's canonization a nod to women's lib, for Mother Seton was a spirited and independent woman. Now, the Vatican was not in the habit um, of nodding to women's liberation. And in fact, the growing feminist awareness among many Catholic sisters led to highly publicized clashes between specific congregations and their clerical superiors in dioceses throughout the United States and, and uh, everywhere over attire, wearing the habit, over the issue of female ordination. And uh, what's lesser known is that Catholic women's blossoming identity as feminist also turned canonization into contested arena. 
at the very moment, the whole process itself was being reworked by this man, John Paul II, now a canonized saint himself, elevated to the papacy in 1978. He canonized more people than all of his predecessors combined and beatified a whopping 1,341. Uh, we'll talk more about this in the third lecture about the particulars of this, but to bring this one to a close, I want to reference the fact that the first uh, cause from the United States and Canada that he beatified was Tekakwita, uh, whose cause had languished since it had been detached from the Jesuits in the early 20th century. Soon after his first visit to the United States, the Pope announced that he would waive the necessary miracle and beatify Tekakwitha without it. It was hailed as an effort to increase indigenous representation in the canon of the saints. I said this last month, but John Paul II understood far better than any of his predecessors that yearning that US and Canadian Catholics had expressed in the 1890s for a saint who had lived among them on their soil. And Tekakwitha was his answer to this. But if John Paul II's first US blessed was presented as a means to empower one segment of the local church, his first US saint tells a very different story in which he effect reversed a decision the local church had made. In October, 1986, the Provincial Superior of the Religious of the Sacred Heart in St. Louis, Missouri, received a startling phone call uh, from the local archbishop. A postulator at the Congregation for the Causes of the Saints, had been renamed that, had approached him with the possibility of canonizing Duchenne. The man had told him, we need somebody, not from Philadelphia, to be canonized in the United States and a woman and a religious would be helpful. John Paul II was planning a second visit to the United States, and he wanted to hold a canonization in conjunction with that, and he wanted the congregation to help him find an appropriate candidate. Duchenne met all the steps, uh, specifications. The not from Philadelphia stipulation had arisen most likely because the cause for canonization of Catherine Drexel, who had founded a congregation in Philadelphia, um, and who I will talk about in my third lecture, was proceeding, so they didn't want to, to spotlight Philadelphia like that. But they needed the congregation's permission to move forward. The superior later wrote that she resisted her first impulse. In my heart of hearts, I don't believe in canonization. She tried to take the easy way out. She told the archbishop, Duchenne hasn't produced any miracles lately. That strategy was foiled soon enough. No further miracle, miracles would be necessary because John Paul II had reduced the number of required ones uh, by half. John Paul II substantially revised the new procedures in 1983. And uh, we will talk more about that and the significance for that, particularly for the local church um, in the third lecture. Um, but there is great irony that one of the changes he made in the revised norms was to remove the stipulation that women could work only through male proxies. And the first female postulator uh, was a Sister of Mercy who was appointed in 1984 to be the postulator for Catherine McCauley, an Irish Sister of Mercy. Now free to propose their own causes though, many women chose not to. It turns out that the RSCJs in their reluctance to pursue the cause, which they eventually reconciled themselves to, uh, Duchenne was canonized in 1988, but the impetus to do so had not come from them and had come from John Paul II. Um, they point to a more systematic shift in US saint seeking, which seems to be an aversion to formal canonization among sisters who reevaluated their ministries and relationships to the hierarchy in the aftermath of Vatican II. Canonization requires repeated engagement with male church officials from the diocesan level all the way up to the Vatican, and many choose uh, not to engage in that. And of course, they also express concerns over the amount of money it takes to sponsor a cause. The resistance is often uh, rooted in the belief that in proposing women for canonization in the Catholic Church is essentially shoe shoehorning them into uh, a very narrow, narrow role models for women. As one RSCJ put it after attending Philippines canonization, new models of womanhood demand new models of saints. And she argued that the Holy See was not ready for those new models. I'll conclude with two Dorothys, both of whom are regarded as people saints, but 
uh, only one of whom has an open cause for canonization. Dorothy Stang was a sister in Notre Dame who was a missionary from the United States to Brazil, where she worked in the Amazon rainforest and fought against the deforestation there and stood up to uh, repeatedly to loggers. Um, uh, sorry, that's the wrong date there. It's 2005. It was February 12th, 2005 that she was murdered um, as a result of her activism. She is widely regarded as a people saint and uh, her biography is Martyr of the Amazon. Yet her cause for canonization is not open and her community um, shows very little inclination to do so. And the same would be true of the four church women murdered in El Salvador in 1980, of the adorers of the precious blood of Christ, uh, five women murdered in Liber Liberia in 1992. They were popularly venerated as martyrs, but they are uh, not open for formal canonization. Another Dorothy, Dorothy Day's cause for canonization is open, but it was proposed by Cardinal O'Connor in 1990. And he suggested that Dorothy Day, the founder of the Catholic Worker Movement um, and a radical, a lifelong radical, um, would be an ideal saint because she could be the patron saint of women who have had abortion and regretted it. It is true that before her before her conversion to Catholicism, uh, Day procured an abortion. Uh, she never wrote about it. She destroyed, ordered all copies destroyed of the autobiography in which she discussed this. But in uh, according to Cardinal O'Connor, um, it was abortion that was the salient fact of her afterlife. And so this typifies what many women feel happens when a cause is turned over to, um, to the Vatican, that their afterlives become about something that um, their lives weren't necessarily about, which of course is a dynamic that I talked about in, in the first lecture and throughout what people represent doesn't always, um, to subsequent generations, doesn't always square with uh, what happened in their lives. Many Catholic workers object to Dorothy Day's canonization because of the money that um, it involves and argue that the money should be diverted to the poor. And uh, many argue that Day herself um, is supposed to have said, don't call me a saint. I don't want to be so easily dismissed. So apparently she argued that once a person is canonized, they are elevated on a pedestal and that it would be far better to be imitated than venerated. These are just two of the multiple complicated causes that are open or are being considered uh, from the United States and from other places as well that I'll explore a little bit more deeply in the third lecture. Gender continues to be a complicating factor, but it is by no means the only one. It's complicated by stories of race and ethnicity and in recent years by revelations regarding clerical sexual abuse, which will certainly surface in my discussion of John Paul II and all the saints. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Cummings. That was just fascinating. And uh, um, to finish off with Dorothy Day, it was a very interesting modern look at, at sainthood. Thank you very much for this. I, I'm gonna now uh, pass it over for some questions. And if people in the audience, if you could uh, click the Q&A button and then type your question in, and then I can read out the, the question to you. So um, just going to that spot. Okay, so uh, from Daniel McLeod, uh, who's the director of our Jesuit Center for Catholic Studies and, and a professor in our uh, Catholic Studies program, he says, this was a fantastic lecture, thank you. I'm wondering whether at the time there was any resistance to the more general idea of balancing the corpus of saints through selecting female saints or saints from particular places. You've spoken about the structural control that men clearly had or the resistance to particular cases because of politics or the pettiness of men in the church. But I wonder whether people in the church rejected these movements towards saintly equality more generally, kind of along the same line as people reject incorrectly, of course, equal opportunity movements in the present day. In short, were people saying they're just canonizing women, Americans, indigenous people, etc. You hinted about this at the end, but I was wondering if you could expand on this. Uh, thank you. That's a that's a good question. I'm not sure I will address it all in in my answer today. I do hope to talk quite a bit more about it uh, in John Paul II. And of course, I won't talk about all 482 people he canonized. And um, but I think that um, 
that he was saying that and just you say were people saying they're just canonizing women americans indigenous etc and john paul ii very consciously wanted to canonize people that were not from europe um he wanted to inject some gender balance. You can see in that question to Duchenne's, we need a woman <laughs> we, and ideally a religious, that would be great. John Paul II had trained as an actor uh, in his early life and he just really understood the power of symbol. So I think that he was, uh, he was very consciously trying to do that. And I don't, um, I haven't seen that, that resistance. It's really interesting. Um, I mentioned there are 12 people from the United States or territory, that later was incorporated into the United States that uh, that have become canonized. And all of the first ones were women. Um, if you don't count the Jesuit martyrs, which as I said in my first lecture, uh, the only two that count are um, uh, Rene Goupil and um, Isaac Jogues. But uh, Flannery O'Connor was asked in the 1950s uh, privately uh, about how she could be part of a church that was sexist. And she said, uh, don't tell me about sexism in the church. The church is just as likely to canonize a woman as a man. And uh, far be it for me to correct Flannery O'Connor, but only about 25% in the whole Canada of the Saints uh, are women. But in the United States, most were women for a very long time, still a slight majority of women. So I think about it as, in a way as, as flipping. Um, in my first lecture, I talked about Brother Andre Bissette becoming the first canonized saint from Holy Cross. So a, a virtually illiterate man who becomes the first canonized saint from a teaching congregation. And I think a little bit, this is the same too, that it's, um, I mean, where in the Catholic church do you have a gender, <laughs> a rough gender parity, um, except in the canonization of, of the saint. So again, I'll, I'll probably deal, ask, answer a little more of your question in the third lecture, but thank you very much for it. You mentioned Flannery O'Connor uh, tonight on PBS on on uh, American American uh, whatever the show is. The uh, anyway, there's a special feature on on Flannery O'Connor. Um, a question from Emmanuel. I am wondering who really was the first female American saint. Oh well, it depends on who you ask. The first female American saint. So here we go. Francis Cabrini was the first U.S. citizen to become, I'm speaking of the United States here. Um, so Fr Francis Cabrini was the first U.S. citizen. Elizabeth Ann Seton was the first American born saint. But then, and then here's where we get really uh, pedantic. When Catherine Drexel, who I will talk about in my third lecture, was canonized in 2000, um, I noticed that she was being billed as the first U.S. born saint. And this was, of course, before I was interested in, I hadn't done any research on this. And um, I thought that's wrong because it's obviously, well, no, I, I, it struck me as odd, but I knew enough to know that the sisters wouldn't promote her. Um, they wouldn't make a mistake. And it took me, I'm embarrassed to say, uh, as an American historian, a, a while to figure out that Seton had been born in 1774. So technically she was born a British subject, which made Catherine Drexel the first US born American saint. So depending on how, how you, firsts are really important and people are willing to twist themselves into pretzels, I think, to, to make that claim. Great, thank you. And I think Emmanuel kind of twisted, gave you a, a, a curveball there. But um, <laughs> from, from Claudia, I didn't catch the first lecture. However, speaking about, for example, Dorothy Day and how it's not about their life, but their afterlife, is that not possibly doing them a disservice or forcing them to represent something they didn't want to be remembered or canonized for. Thank you, Claudia. I hope you'll listen to the first lecture because I do talk about this concept of, of the afterlife, how people live on in historic memory. And in this sense, it's not unlike, um, you know, who we honor by federal holidays or who we put on postage stamps or whose names we affix to buildings. It tells us more about what we value than about them. The most dramatic example from the last lecture relates to a woman, I, I, to, to Philippine Duchenne, who was renamed. Her name was Rose Philippine Duchenne, and she was billed as the Rose of Missouri um, as a way to uh, contrast with Rose of Lima. Uh, she was never called Rose in her lifetime, but in her afterlife, it became a really great way to talk about her as, um, as an exemplar of holiness. And as for doing a disservice to them, I, you know, the way I like to think about it, well, it's, it's a lot like what we do in history. I mean, in a way, trying to capture anyone's life is, is uh, risking doing them a disservice because we, we represent them in the way that we see them and based on limited evidence. But the way I think about it spiritually, 
is that canonization does nothing for the people so honored. Canonization just recognizes that they're in God's eternal presence, affirms, the Catholic Church affirms through a long process, um, but it doesn't put them there. <laughs> so in a sense, um, there, a canonized person has been in God's eternal, believers uh, believe that has been in God's eternal presence from the moment of their deaths. And therefore what we do with them, it's frustrating to the people that knew them, uh, certainly it can be, but it's not particularly surprising. So uh, it happens all the time. I was only able to refer glancingly to the issue of Dorothy Day uh, coming to be really a, a poster child for abortion in a way she would have she, she would have hated um, and worked actively against. I mean, Dorothy Day protested everything in her, in her lifetime. And, and she never, she never spoke about Roe v. Wade. She never, she never talked about her own experience. And, and so I think, yes, to have her, yes, I think it is a, a disservice, but I, I don't know. I, 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 it's very consistent with what's, what happens with saints. Who we honor tells us much more about us than it does about them. Yeah, I mean, she was known for her support of the worker, right? The Catholic worker newspaper that was named after the daily worker, but it was the Catholic worker. And she was in solidarity with the strikers of the graveyard. And uh, the bishop was very angry with her for supporting the, the striking uh, 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 grave diggers. Anyway, to the next question, Richard uh, says, the costs of the beatification process was mentioned several times. How expensive is it to make a saint? What are some of the more major expenses? Thank you for a wonderful lecture. Oh, Richard, I have so many Holy Cross priests that I have promised uh, endless drinks if they can tell me what they're paying their postulator in Rome, um, uh, who's a very, very distinguished man uh, who runs a lot of, of causes. It's really hard. Um, it's really hard to, to tell. Uh, exactly. It was done. Uh, the cause for canonization of Catherine Drexel was um, Ken Woodward in his wonderful book, Making Saints, actually got the Archbishop of Philadelphia to tell the Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament exactly what they paid. And I don't remember the number offhand, but I can tell you that the expenses are um, akin to what you'd have. A, a good analogy would be if you took a case all the way up to the Supreme Court. Um, so you have to hire witness, you have to compensate witnesses and get testimony and hire lawyers kind of at every stage. And these things play out over decades, um, in some cases, centuries. So that's why uh, so many religious, members of religious communities are canonized. One reason anyway, is because the labor that they provided was donated, it was free, it was folded into the community. And that's part of the resistance of so many women's communities today. They just don't have the labor to devote to that. Um, and then you, there's money for uh, the ceremonies, each ceremony, you know, it's a big party. There's a gift given to the Pope on this occasion. Um, you know, I, I, people often ask me like, are there bribes and things like that? And I mean, in my <laughs> extensive research, there are often, in in letters references to I enclose however many lira for your you know whatever but I mean it's it's not an out and out but I think there was a lot of cash flowing back and forth but it's really hard to pin down like today like I said you you would hire a postulator um, and again I'm I'm dying to find out um, what the Congregation of Holy Cross pays but nobody's been able to find out yet. Great, thank you. So from Peter, uh, just trying to fully understand, are you saying that canonization was a good used, was, was, was a good used by women in the church to go up in the power structure and used for women empowerment in the church? Chris has a typo there. Oh, okay. Uh, he meant to say it was a tool used by women in the church. Okay, thank you. Well, Peter, I'm still trying to fully understand that myself as I, I've been studying women in the church for a long time. And I think what was so remarkable to me is that until 1983, women could not represent themselves before the Holy See. I looked at it in the particular case of canonization, but this is true in other ways as well. Um, male proxies or male mediators. Women, I think of all the missionaries, the sisters who traveled throughout the globe uh, from, from Europe, who themselves never went to Rome, but had to travel under the auspices of Rome and under Rome's authority. And so I think in the case of what Isabel Tui did successfully, 
was that she made a concerted effort that in the end succeeded. It took a long time. Um, but in saying that she was able to, in seeking to become, to control the afterlife and to control the story of Elizabeth Ann Seton, she was also claiming power for herself in a church that wouldn't recognize the power that she had or, or did in some way. She certainly had more than a lay woman. And then there's an irony that at the very moment that Catholic women then have access to the Holy See, many of them are not engaging or consciously deciding not to engage for reasons that I well understand. Um, but I, I think it's, I tried to use canonization as a way, yes, for women to claim uh, power in the church. And um, Tui's story is I think remarkable. Um, it's also remarkable that it's Seton that again is a person that anyone who went to a Catholic school in the United States her, would recognize her name. And just to realize how close they came in 1948, the Holy See did to just saying, you know what, forget about it. <laughs> um, so I think, I hope that uh, explains it a little bit better. But yes, I think that um, I'm very interested in these interlocking systems of power. Um, that in the case of someone who really was a misogynist, I think, I, 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 it's funny, I treated Burjo uh, when I wrote about him, I treated the situation with humor and I think a, a little bit of humor, it's not that funny, um, but I was very judicious. And I think um, I, I'm more, um, and, and I think this has to do with the clergy sex abuse and the revelations that are coming out. I think these, these interlocking systems of power are more apparent. So for example, I've done a lot of research on um, the Archdiocese of Philadelphia and sex abuse in the 40s and 50s um, under Doherty's, Doherty was Archbishop from 1918 to, to 1951. And I could see how he, I, I have evidence that he removed priests or looked the other way. And, and to me, this is all part of it. Um, the same kind of thing that he was repeatedly, I, I don't make any claim about sexuality with Virgil, nothing like that. But the way that he constantly protected him when the evidence suggested he was in the wrong. So that's where I'm coming from on this. Thank you. So a question from Julian Fredette, and he's from the, um, um, the Archdiocese of St. Boniface across the river. Uh, in reading the lives of the saints every morning, I am often intrigued with the question, how is it that, one, that the one to whom the miracle was attributed, did people choose to pray to that particular person for the miracle? often there seems to be no connection between the two parties? Well, uh, lots of ways to answer that question. I, it is fascinating when there is no connection. I have to tell you, Catherine Drexel, who I keep signaling, I'm gonna talk about next time. Um, both of Catherine Drexel's miracles, her authenticated miracles involved cures from um, deafness. <laughs> and, and she had nothing to do with no schools for the deaf. She wasn't deaf. Um, and so her postulator was asked, what's, what's going on here? And uh, he said, well, maybe she's just trying to telling it. She's telling us we need to listen more. Um, so it is true. Often there's no connection. But to your question about who chooses to pray for that particular person, this is going to sound uh, more cynical than I intended to be, but, but canonization is, has to do a lot with marketing. And it's about, it's why the RSCJs founded the Duchenne Guild Bulletin, get her story out there. Because um, it's, it's why people would engage, post, vice postulators would engage hospital chaplains to try to get the story of the person they were pursuing in the hands of people who might be near a dying person or a severely ill person. So um, it's about getting the story and where, yeah, where do we find the stories? What are the connections? And of course, I love to ask people, you know, why, why this saint? Why is it, um, why is it for you? I mean, for, for me, Mother Theodore Guerin, she was canonized in 2006 and that was the first person I ever, it was, she was a big, it was a big deal here in Indiana. She was the first saint from Indiana. And I was just so intrigued. I was teaching a class um, on women in the church and, and many of my students were really frustrated with the church at that time and felt themselves to be disconnected. And I invited her vice postulator to come speak to my class. And um, they loved hearing the story about a woman who was disobedient uh, in her lifetime, who was someone who was then being canonized. So yeah, it's really hard to know the answer. Um, 
but I always ask, and, and I do think I alluded to this briefly about uh, Elizabeth Ann Seton's failed miracle, which I think is just such a, it's, it's such a sign about the disconnect between personal devotion and the official process, because what is a failed miracle, right? <laughs> it, it didn't count for canonization, but it can't be a failed miracle to the person who, who benefits from it. And I always say, um, as a mother, I understand that that mother's impulse to kind of call down all the saints, the little flower, Elizabeth Ann Seton, whoever, you know, but if you're, if you're going to go <laughs> from the perspective of the Holy See, you got to put all your eggs in one saintly basket. You just got to, um, so you'll see sometimes if you go to um, websites that promote a saint, there will be a very particular prayer for the cause for canonization. And you have to read that particularly because it has to later, if there is a miracle, there has to be evidence between the invocation of that particular saint and the miracle. Wow. So, so here's a question from Tom Nesmith. He's, he's a leading scholar in our college who works in the area of archival research. He says, many thanks for a wonderful lecture. Would you elaborate a bit more on the connection between sainthood of women and the fate of female ordination? If a woman could be a saint after all, why not a priest? Is that <laughs> argument made? And if so, how was it dealt with? Um, well, certainly some people uh, have made and are, are making it. I think in my case, it was just the, 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 the proximity between Seton's canonization, which was billed um, in, the, in Catholic circles and, as I said, in, in secular ones, in Time magazine, as kind of a nod to uh, the, <laughs> the reemerging feminist movement. Um, at the very same time, you know, John Paul II's first visit to the United States in 1979, when he announced that he'd be beatifying Tequiquita, um, the head of what was then called the, um, well, what is still called the Leadership Conference of Women Religious, which was the group that Mary Luke Togan had, Tobin had, had headed the, this umbrella organization. She was chosen to greet him on behalf of all women religious. And she used the occasion to plead for the entry of women into all minist uh, ministries of the church. And because you're in archives, I'll tell you that one of my favorite things to look at in the Notre Dame archives are Teresa Kane's papers, this head of the LCWR, she's a sister of mercy, um, is a sister of mercy. And the letters she got in response to that, if you read it, it's a very, I think a very beautifully and very short uh, welcome, but uh, she got absolutely hammered by many people for daring to raise that with him. I do think they're all about the same thing. It's about women being uh, recognized as, as, as people within the church. And, and again, in canonization, it's, it's, it's remarkable that really till 1983, there was no way that, that, that in, in choosing to go to Rome herself in 1950, um, Isabel Tui was, was flouting rules. Um, and so it's relatively recent uh, that this has happened, but they're connected. Um, but I wasn't invited to give a talk on women's ordination, thankfully. <laughs> Great. So, so the next question is from Father Albert Ivard, and he's a visiting scholar from Belgium who's, who teaches in law and in Catholic studies. So his question, on one side, we have congregations uh, feminine or not, seeking, a, a feminal or not, I'm not sure, seeking and or supporting a candidate to beatification or canonization. On the other side, we have downsizing congregations by aging and lack of vocations. Could a third side be added about the state of faithful devotion to saints? Um, in other words, do the beatification or canonization increase the number of our intercessors in heaven fit the need of the faithful on earth? Well, I think that's a great question. And I'm kind of of the philosophy, uh, the more the more the merrier, you know, the, the more models that there are, and certainly they are increasing. I was very struck and gratified by the canonization of Carlos Acutis in, um, Carlo Acutis in, I think just October, the first millennial saint, a 15 year old um, who was canonized. Um, or was it beatified? Sorry, I, I, I need to check that. Anyway, it was a big deal. I did a lot of interviews um, really globally in this. And I was struck by my students who are not millennials, but um, a, a bit younger than that. They loved seeing the pictures of him because he was wearing Nike sneakers and blue jeans. And they just thought, wow, that's, <laughs> that's what they wear. And so I do think, um, I do think there are an infinite number 
John Paul II believed that that holiness flowed through diverse channels and that it should be recognized in, in many ways as possible. And I do think the Catholic Church probably needs to do a better job of increasing the models that are available, certainly in terms of gender, but um, broadly, more broadly speaking as well, because, because of the nature of the process, it's a very legalistic process. It's very, you do kind of have to fit into a box. Um, and I think we could do with making it more flexible. I'm not sure if that answers your question, but I think, um, uh, I think there is a yearning for, um, for relationships with saints in whom we can see ourselves, um, uh, who are holier than us, but who we could aspire to be like. And yes, more and more of them are not members of religious communities. Now, here's the problem with that, though. Um, you do need someone that can carry a cause through the decades or centuries it takes to complete. So congregations had that built in, that historic memory. In the case of Carlo Acutis, of course, his parents are still alive and remember him. But for most members of the laity, you know, um, maybe their children would remember them, perhaps their grandchildren, but they pass out of memory um, through the generations in a way that doesn't happen for religious. So, I mean, John Paul II, but others before him, other popes before him talked about a need for more lay saints, but it's just not been fulfilled yet, I think, although there's more of them. So there are a number of questions that came up about the, the cost of canonization and, and sainthood. And so I think you, you've addressed that, but there is one from Modi Shijanya, past dean of our college. Uh, she, she asks, because of the cost involved, could the church sponsor a fund like a scholarship fund, you can tell she was a dean, um, to, to defray these costs and remove financial costs in honoring the work of saints. You know what, I'll do even one better. Um, I think, um, because actually that was part of John Paul II's motivation in making it more streamlined, less expensive. But remember the Pope can do whatever he wants. And so, I mean, there's, there's and he's, he's done that. Pope Francis has canonized people um, equivalent canonization it, he, he did with uh, Marie of the Incarnation and Bishop Laval in 2014. Um, I think someone like Dorothy Stang, who I mentioned, gosh, I think he should just, if I were advising him on this, he hasn't asked me, but I, I think he should just go ahead and canonize her. She's the Laudato Si Saint um, that he could do it. So I think, yeah, sponsoring a fund is one way. And in my first lecture, I actually talked about a U.S. priest who, who proposed exactly that. In his case, he was talking about countries that couldn't stand the, uh, the expense. But you're right, now it's, it's more congregations. So I think there are a lot of ways around it. I think more, a thornier problem is this issue of engagement. Um, there are very few women working, uh, there may, I'm not sure if there are any, there are no American women working at the, um, no English speaking women working at the Congregation for the Causes of the Saints. Um, one journalist who wrote a history of Mother Theodore Guerin's cause titled a chapter, Men and Money, boiling down, because even though she was canonized, it created some dissension within her congregation about whether this was a good idea and boiled down to those two things. So the next one is more a comment than a question, but I'll put it out. Peter, Peter Trombley says, great lecture, thanks. My eldest daughter is in the middle of her thesis, thesis in Canadian studies and the theme of her subject entails the lack of women in the education field. This is consistent to the matter of Catholic saints, uh, all true with the world today. Did you wanna comment on that? Well, uh, what better month to, to say that than Women's History Month? And um, you know, women's history, it's not that we tell, I mentioned that at the outset that this was kind of a wild story and I, I hope uh, an interesting story, but we tell these stories not just because they're interesting, uh, but because they help us understand things about the past, but also about the present. And I think for me, understanding the way um, uh, women were marginalized for so long in, in a variety of fields is galvanizing. I certainly find that with my students, um, that, they're, that it inspires them. And, and I'm sure your daughter as well is writing a thesis about this and she wants to help make a difference. So I think we use, this is why we have Women's History Month and it shouldn't be all in one month, it should be all year, but we use this to uh, imagine how things could be differently and how we could be more inclusive. I mean, it's not, it's everywhere. I, I, been kind of glued to the um, NCAA basketball tournaments here and it went viral that there was, you know, the contrast between the men's weight room and the women's weight room, this kind of went all over Twitter and it was just 
it was unbelievable. And Coach Muffet McGraw, former coach of Notre Dame basketball, just said, who's surprised? <laughs> you know, this is in every way um, there is inequity in every arena. So good for your daughter. Good luck to her. So Sister Susan Wakim, who is a longtime principal, president of St. Mary's Academy here in Winnipeg, a very established uh, 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 girls high school here in the city. She made the comment one time that in the church, the career ladder for women in education surpassed outside of the church, that there are women that you'd see in North America becoming presidents, becoming principals that you did not see in the 50s and 60s elsewhere in North America. So I just want to add that to you know, the conversation. I, I really, yeah, that's, that's um, I think that's such an important point. I wrote a bit about that in uh, my first book, New, New Women of the Old Faith, and just about how, and, and it was focused on the United States, but um, from the, in, in the United States history, from the early 19th century until the late 1960s, your average Catholic woman, when she looked around her, where did she see the opportunities for meaningful work, for education, for, um, for professional development, although they didn't call it that? It was within church structures. Uh, far more women were running hospitals, universities um, under Catholic auspices long before they were doing so under secular auspices. And then since the late 1960s, that has reversed itself, that your average Catholic woman looks around her and sees the opportunities for all of those things, meaningful work, education, outside of church structures. So it's it's a really important, um, it, it's, it's really interesting to think about. Um, and I guess I don't want to, you know, still there were limits. Uh, women did have a lot of opportunities through that, although there was still this dynamic um, they were often forced to cultivate sympathetic male clerical allies to protect them against the, the least ones, but you're absolutely right. So I have a few more questions here uh, from Dr. Emika Sassmary, who uh, I introduced last at the last lecture. She's the past president of the University of Manitoba, president emeritus now, and an anthropologist. So be careful in your answers here. So she asked, is there any risk to faithful Catholics that among contemporary saints elevated recently though they may have lived hundreds of years ago, one or more may have something may have something discovered about them that today is considered heinous. For example, owned slaves are considered immigrants to the U.S., the dregs of European societies. Uh, absolutely. And I reference briefly the postponement of Fulton Sheen's cause uh, for exactly this reason. This might be something um, that we can talk about next time, but I think the report on Cardinal McCarrick um, uh, has, well, I don't think, I know, has raised questions about whether John Paul II was canonized too soon before we understood uh, enough about his complicity in, um, in clerical sex abuse. It's actually what I'm gonna be talking about in relation to Catherine Drexel, who I keep, um, <laughs> I keep uh, promoting here, but Catherine Drexel was a remarkable woman who, founded what in, in 1890, the Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament for Native Americans and colored people. It's now just called the Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament. Um, I'll say more about her next time, but um, she was doing more for Native Americans and African Americans, certainly than any other US Catholic, but she didn't accept black women into her congregation. And you know, by today's standards, uh, She's a segregationist. Um, so I, I'm gonna kind of use her as an example to play with this idea of what do we do with that? What do we do with the fact that even the saints were complicit in society's sins? And I don't, I'll just tell you, I don't have an answer to that, but it's a, it's a fascinating question to consider. So yes, absolutely. And I think it's why, I think it's why this five-year requirement. To, so another change that John Paul II made, he reduced the 50-year requirement between a person's death and cause for canonization opening um, from 50 years to five years. And as a historian, I, I think that's a mistake because <laughs> you got to let historians do their work and figure, figure out and let some time go by. That's more for an economist than a historian. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I'll, there are two more questions, then I'll, I'll, then I'll, I'll stop, okay? Um, one is from Christopher Harenko, who, who uh, has been a scholar before in our college here and also teaches at St. Thomas uh, University at uh, St. Thomas More College at, in Saskatchewan. And his question is, can you tell us more about how the big, <laughs> quotation mark, big professional postulators operate today? 
Oh, well, I'm afraid I don't know too much about them. I know there are, um, now many, many are members of religious congregations. I mean, certainly the big congregations would, would have their own, the Jesuit postulators and Franciscan postulators and such like that. I, there are, um, the, the norms in, the revised norms in 1983 did make it possible to have uh, lay people working for them. And the guy I was referring to is um, named Andrea Ambrosi, and, and he was the one that oversaw the canonization of Brother Andre Bissette, who I talked about the first time, and of course is known in Canada. Um, and Brother Andre had had, I think he had gone through maybe seven postulators um, before uh, Ambrosi came in. And Ambrosi was also the postulator for um, Mother Theodore Guerin. And um, I found in various archives him writing letters to uh, religious congregations advertising his services. So if you're interested, you know, that, um, and it's actually where I got some of my evidence uh, about women being reluctant to do it because very few of them are willing to go on the record with that. So I kind of had to um, find other evidence. And so I, I would find in their, their replies or their notes on his letters, no, we're not interested, that kind of thing. So how do they operate? I mean, it's actually, I mean, it's not as glamorous as I probably picture it. I mean, but you live in Rome and um, it's a lot of documentation. I, I think it's a lot like being an attorney, I, I would imagine. Great. So the last question from Sister Elaine Beatty who uh, is with the Grey Nuns in Montreal, but originally uh, from, from Manitoba. Uh, given that there were several, several women observers at Vatican II, how much of the preparation of seven was influenced, the Roman numeral seven, was influenced by the feminist movement before it began? Was it considered in the preparation of seven? And how much I, after? I think, I think it's Vatican II, not seven. Oh, Thank sorry. You. I'm Showing yeah. my political science background. So, so uh, the preparation of Vatican II was influenced by the feminist movement before it began. Was it considered in the preparation of Vatican II and how much after? Sorry, Sister Elaine. Thank you, Sister Elaine. That's a question that I um, am very curious about. I don't think we know too much about it yet. So there's, there's very few histories of women in the council. One tellingly is a memoir of women at the council named Guests in Our Own House which reflects the fact that they were given the statuses of audit, status of auditors, not, um, not voting members. Um, so I think, um, you know, certainly like Cardinal Sunins of, of Belgium, who is the one that said in between, well, he, after the second session, how can we debate the future of the church when half of it is missing? It was him that got the uh, 15 women observed. It's interesting to read um, Mary Luke Tobin and also this um, RSCJ superior I mentioned, um, Sabina de Valon. Um, they were clearly there, they were engaged. Um, I don't know how much they were involved in the preparatory uh, preparation of the documents. Um, and I don't think this is something we know yet. And again, as a historian, this is still fairly recent. And uh, I don't think there's been enough research done in this area. Great, thank you very much. And, and um, as you said before the first lecture to me, you said that the Q&A would be very interesting as well as the lecture. And, and I totally agree. This has been a fascinating Q&A as well as with the lecture. So I wanna thank you very much for this wonderful opportunity to, to have this presentation. And just to round off, I, I wanna say a few things of thank yous to people uh, for, for helping this lecture happen. And first the Hanley Lecture uh, Selection Committee which consists of Christine Butterell, who, who is in the audience, John Stapleton, John Stafford, and Daniel McLeod, who is another questioner today. Uh, the Logistics Committee, which includes Bonnie Warkentine, Lisa McCausland, and Matt Simshishan. And Matt Simshishan is also thanked for handling all the marketing and advertising. I know you spoke to Matt back and forth on a, on a number of things, as well as John Funk, who designed that wonderful poster and all the social media work that was done. And Jason Brennan, who is the occasional voiceover that came in when I was doing something incorrectly. So he handled the technical logistics for setting up this webinar. And finally, uh, I, I do wanna thank all the donors for the initial Hanley Fund and those who continue to donate to make this lecture possible. And for those who are able to, please donate at our St. Paul's College Foundation. You can donate through canadahelps.org and that website, canadahelps.org. And you, there's a little spot now, there wasn't before, but a little spot there for a call down menu on the, the foundation website for the Hanley series. So anybody who wishes to make a donation. But I, I do wanna thank you, Dr. Cummings, for this really stimulating lecture and the Q&A. And we're, we're, we've now done two out of three. And I think this has just been wonderful by, 
We've been able to discern over these presentations over two months, and now we'll be able to do it over a third month. And our last lecture that you'll be presenting uh, will also be having one of our awardees. Uh, there's a Hanley Essay Award, and, and we'll be giving it to the student at that event. So uh, thanks very much. The next lecture is April 13th, and, and thank you, Dr. Cummings. We look forward to that presentation. Thank you, Dr. Adams. Thanks to everyone. It's been an honor to be with you. Take care. Bye-bye.